makes a lot of sense and it's an obvious phrase. It's not a problem for anyone. Mathematical uh, creativity is a little bit more questionable, but among uh, scientific people, there's no doubt that mathematicians are, cr uh, are creative and that there is such thing as uh, mathematical creativity. But mathemusical creativity is something new. Uh, what, what could it mean? Uh, actually, during this session, we're going to approach this question uh, through three different angles. So, mathemusical creativity could be assimilated to computational creativity. That is, when you build up mathematical models in order to represent and, and model uh, uh, some parts of the musical um, ph phenomena, uh, then you can use these models uh, as computational tools in order to generate things and uh, things that you hope will be interesting to humans. So this would, would be one aspect of mathemusical uh, creativity. Another aspect of ma uh, mathemusical creativity could be uh, instrumental creativity. That is, uh, the way geometrical models representing the structures of vibrating bodies uh, uh, foster human creativity uh, uh, in the way uh, they, that they, they open new perspectives on how to generate interesting sounds and combine these sounds into musical systems. A third uh, view on uh, mathemusical creativity you're going to hear this afternoon would be the psychological and cognitive approach. That is, how do agents, whether they be human agents or even artificial agents, how do agents create new things by either uh, uh, just recombining existing systems or actually challenging this system and sometimes breaking them down to pieces in order to bring out new revolutionary uh, ideas. So, uh, for this very interesting uh, session on, on creativity, I'm very uh, proud and honored uh, to host uh, Professor Jean-Pierre uh, Bourguignon. Uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon is a mathematician, a specialist in uh, differential geometry, and uh, he's a highly praised uh, mathematician, had many prestigious prizes like the Prix uh, Paul Langevin or the Médaille de Bronze du CNRS, uh, among others. Jean-Pierre Bourguignon has been head of the uh, IHES, the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques, that's right, Jean-Pierre, which is, uh, well, in France, it's a school. It's a, a famous school in France. In France, we call this our uh, field medal factory because many of our uh, uh, mathematicians who actually got the field medal were trained or are professors in this institution and Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon was also head of the uh, uh, European Mathematical uh, Society and right now he's head of the European Research Council. And uh, we, we will have also Margaret Bowden, who is professor at the University of uh, Sussex. And uh, Margaret uh, has been trained in many different domains, such as medical science, psychology, philosophy, uh, uh, co cognitive science. And she's one of the person who uh, uh, con have, has contributed to this revolution uh, where uh, cogniz cognitive science and artificial intelligence, that is the computational view and the psycho uh, uh, neuroscientific view have converged into a new domain that opens a lot of new, very interesting uh, perspective. So we are only three because I'm the chairman of the session uh, as well as a speaker of the session and even the first speaker of the session. So uh, I will give the first talk, then Jean-Pierre will talk, and then uh, Margaret will, will, uh, will talk. Actually, I think maybe there was there were not uh, enough money left, so we could have uh, a chairman and a speaker and a third speaker. So uh, I will I will try to do both and commute between the two roles. So uh, I'm, I'm giving the first talk. Uh, Creative dynamics of improvised musical uh, interaction. So uh, a few months ago, I was in Athens, Gre uh, Greece, for a computer music conference. I was invited to a philosophical talk 
in the very place uh, in, uh, uh, where Arist Aristotle used to teach, which is called the Aristotle uh, Academy. And we had to find some connection between the Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy and computer music and uh, mathematical mu modeling of music and computational approaches to music. And I had the idea that there was a connection between a certain vision, a certain metaphysical vision of the universe by Plato and uh, Aristotle, and the way uh, ideal musical system, whether they be natural or uh, computational, uh, do work. So the, the, the common thing is that both integrate the two axes of cause on one hand and form on the other hand. So for these philosophers and for the Occidental metaphysics for like 20 centuries after them, uh, the, 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 the idea of form uh, is the idea of the, there is, uh, the fact that there is an immanent, that is, that, that is it's, it's always there, you know, it's uh, uh, environing us. There's an immanent action of rationality that regulate form and, and specifically musical form, like if you had a bird's view on space and time. This is what a composer has when, when, it, when he or she is looking at uh, uh, the score. It's a bird's view. Uh, act, actually, time is spatialized. You have a spatial view on time. So you can decide whatever you like. Uh, you can decide that take, to take something uh, from the end, put it at the beginning, etc. And on the other hand, so this is form. And on the other hand, you have the, uh, another kind of action, which, which is causality or necessity. The fact that A entails B, entails C, uh, involves D, etc., etc. And it's called by the philosopher transcendent in the sense that B is not very well aware of what had caused A and what, why, why A is here and conditioning uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the future. So for B, A comes from another world. It's transcendent. So is it, it's the, the idea idea of the unchainment of course, the idea of entropy and also the, uh, the idea that the world is, is quite chaotic. So uh, uh, um, back to music, you have the idea of formal and long range decisions that are linked to intelligible form, that is the structures that the composer builds up into his uh, uh, in composition, but this thing which are kind of static, geometrical, topological views, if you want to, stick, uh, to speak with a math uh, mathematician language, are permanently challenged by reality that is things happening in the real world, events, actions, improvisations, unpredi uh, unpredictable things, unpredictable consequences stemming from uh, entropy of the physical uh, uh, universe. So uh, if you want to be a little bit more precise in music, this is uh, a few examples uh, that i drawn from research uh, carried at Dirkam in my, my, my lab. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, here uh, you have uh, a sequence, by, of course, uh, uh, which is the harmonic structures of Chopin Prelude, uh, Opus 28, Number 4. It's a study by uh, Bigot, Javito, uh, and, and André Atop where you see that actually uh, the, the, the chord evolution is modeled by a topological structure called complex, uh, simplicial complexes. Uh, it's the idea that you have a certain space which is, which is static, and the music is not the space, it's a trajectory inside this space. But the space is configured smartly, so the trajectory will be optimal, would be very, uh, very simple to uh, express. And in that case, you see that you're moving from one chord to another chord just by a common edge, which is a simple transition with a single note which is changing from one chord to the other. And this is a composition by Julia Blondeau, a young composer. Uh, was inspired by this topological uh, structure. So this is the form, and it's immanent, and then you navigate into the form, and there you encounter uh, uh, causality, uh, uh, necessity, and entropy. So if you're in the physical medium, for, for instance, you have performers actually playing the, the music, and that, then it, it becomes a physical wave in a, uh, uh, in a space, uh, uh, then a, a lot of things which are not predicted and which are not encoded into the score will uh, have happened, uh, uh, obviously. This is the, the lowest level. It's the physical world. But between the formal world and the physical world, you have plenty of level of mathematical representation. So here, for instance, it's a signal. Um, uh, it comes from, from the mathematics of signals. And it represents not a, uh, not a, a sound signal, but a gestural uh, uh, signal. So uh, it's a study where the people try to understand and model and learn the way uh, uh, instrumentists move their body when they are uh, playing in order to be able to categorize gesture, to model them, and then to be, to be able to play and interact, to have a computer system interacting with humans. 
So in my lab, we have designed a lot of uh, tools and softwares for uh, uh, handling uh, wh wh whether it be forms or uh, necessity or causality. And this is Open Music, a visual language for composer, which is m more oriented towards form. That is, it is the tool that composers use in order to build up high-level symbolic structures. Uh, but, sorry. But the thing I wanted to um, um, tell you um, today uh, is not about uh, uh, um, uh, composing uh, structures and forms, but uh, 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 but how to uh, model uh, the, the the idea of improvised interaction between human and computational agents uh, in an improvised uh, in, in in an improvised way. So, um, uh, in general, uh, in other, when when one tries tries to understand this kind of uh, situation. Uh, what, what an agent should do is evaluate past history of the environment, uh, analyze incoming events that are coming from the env environment, so this is un uh, unpredictable, this is the, the real causality, and build up a memory model where uh, things are learned and uh, no musical knowledge is, is uh, aggregated and gathered uh, in order to be able to build up some anticipation strategies and to guess what's coming and to decide uh, uh, for, for an agent to decide why, what it's going to do. And there, there, again, you could find the idea of static form represented and modeled by a geometrical structure or topological structure. So here again, uh, as you had uh, this in composition, you will have this kind Kind of dialectics between form and causality. So, uh, in general, in such systems, you will have uh, some, some machine listening uh, uh, device. Uh, the idea is extract high level features from the signal and segment the signal and turn them into significant symbolic unit. So you will have perception aware and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and cognitively, uh, cognitive aware models trying to, uh, um, to discover an alphabet, a symbol structure over the raw uh, signal and organize it into a symbolic stream. Then in a second sta stage you're going to have uh, some machine learning that is discover and assimilate on the fly intelligent, intelligent scheme pattern, uh, discover patterns uh, and build up some memory uh, model into a uh, stylistic sequence model because actually what you capture with this kind of memory model is uh, some kind of representation of surface representation of style uh, and then you want to generate, navigate the model, generate and run on new phrases and interact with the musician. So this listen, learn, generate, which is a very classical loop, uh, is actually made up of uh, concurrent and competitive and cooperating processes that run in parallel in a, in a concurrent uh, way. And the idea is, is to try to build up some machine musicianship and some smart musical memory and to try to have some creative musical agent that can play with human in a way that human will find interesting. This is the big uh, uh, challenge. So to uh, show you this very quickly, this is our epistemological setup, the, 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 our metaphorical reference uh, where we uh, situate all the, the, the components of this, this kind of system. So you have someone improvising and you have this double loop because an, impro pro, an improvising agent, rem remember it could be human or it could be artificial, it has some self-listening, it listens to itself, but it listens to the others. But all this uh, information that, uh, that, that is perceived uh, regress in time and is stored in some form of, of, of structured memory and make up some reservoir, rep repertoire of musical images and musical ideas that are stored in a compressed way and that are evoked and rendered back into the creative process. That is, in, an improviser is always digging into his memory, taking things, recombining things, reinventing, inventing new new shapes, uh, uh, so that the information is stored uh, in, in, so to speak, a creative uh, um, um, storage uh, format, which is a compressed format. So, uh, oh, this, and this is, uh, Omax is just the name of the software that we have built and that does all this, right? So, uh, um, I talked about compression, so um, a researcher, Hutter, showed uh, years ago that uh, uh, to, to, to phrase it the way he, he did, computing the optimal behavior of a rational agent is equivalent to, comp to compressing its observation. 
And another way to put it is that there is a close connection uh, in artificial intelligence between machine learning and comp um, compression. Because a system that predicts, it, when you do machine learning, you want to train systems so they are able to predict things and to behave in an intelligent way. So uh, a system that predicts the, uh, the posterior probabilities of a sequence, given the entire history, can be used for optimal compression. And the reverse way, if you have an optimal compressor, then it can be used for universal uh, prediction. Uh, by finding the symbol that compresses best given the previous history. So at the beginning of this uh, study, we used compression scheme. We actually used softwares and models that, we, that are used uh, every day for compressing data, such as the LZ, lamp -LZ, uh, model. I won't detail this, this, just to tell you that if you take a sequence and you try to compress it, you're gonna build, you're gonna, you are going to build some structure, which is a kind of dictionary of patterns. So for instance, for this sequence, you will have this, this dictionary of pattern, and usually this dictionary of patterns are organized into high-level structures like trees and graphs. And in, in, this, in, in this case, you, you will have uh, some parts of, of, the, of this pattern will act as a context, and other parts of, of the pattern will act as a prediction, and it's very close to Markov machine, or all this kind of, of stuff. So for instance, if you, if, you, if you locate, if you recognize, or if you generate the pattern AB, you know by, you, by um, uh, thanks to your compression machine, you know that there's a strong probability that this will be followed by C or by A, etc. So the idea is that uh, in any um, se sequential form, uh, you have contexts and uh, 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 you have possible uh, continuation, and you can use this in a creative way for generating new things. So for instance, every time you have the same context, you can decide to jump from the end of a context to the end of another occurrence of the same context, which in effect will create, as you can see here, it will create a new form. So if you play this, it will be stylistically very similar to uh, this, which is what you learn from the musician, but it's a phrase that has never been played by the musician. This is very simple, this is very easy, and it's connected to many Markovian machines for generating uh, music, but we want to go a little bit further, just to, just to show you that just this simple setup uh, um, can help you to imitate stylistically uh, nice things. This is a, a generation in the style of the Richard Carr by uh, uh, Bach. No sound. Yep. You can generate hours and hours and hours of such music, and it can, it, it can actually fool specialists of Bach, uh, well, we, we have tried act, actually, because it's slightly the same and slightly dif different at every uh, moment uh, in time. This is typically what statistical model will uh, give you. Now we want to go a little bit further because we want to be able to interact, to have models interacting with humans. So we need some sort of representation of knowledge. We need this general epistemological framework I told you about, and we need some perceptual and generative uh, strategies. So, uh, talking about listening strategies, uh, not entering into all the details, the idea is that uh, the signal is analyzed and cut into pieces and then there are uh, discovery me me mechanisms trying to label things and try to find uh, symbols and to uh, cluster things into some geometry. So usually it is done in a Euclidean space, so for instance if you locate uh, uh, chunks of signal that are quite similar, they, they will tend to form balls into a Euclidean space and then at a certain point you will label your ball and say okay this is A and then this is B etc etc. So we have tried plenty of things. An, an interesting uh, mathematical device here, it was in the PhD uh, thesis of uh, Archia Comte, a researcher uh, working now uh, at IRCAM. He had the idea to use information geometry. Information geometry is a new mathematical tool that has been used only for uh, 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 a, few, a few years and um, uh, developed in, in particular in Japan by uh, Amari, uh, which tells you that instead of working 
uh, tells you that instead of working into Euclidean space, you should work into, into differential geometrical space, which are parametric space, where points are actually densities of probabilities. Points are uh, uh, probability distribution. So this is what, why it is called information space, because every point can capture information about a system. So between two points, you won't have a distance, because you can't have a, a distance in such uh, spaces. We have an informa uh, informational divergence like the cool bike libeler di divergence, which is not symmetrical and which, which does not give you the uh, um, um, inegalité triangulaire, uh, triangular uh, inequality. So it's not a matrix, but you can do plenty of things with such device. And for instance, here you can see a signal, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a Beethoven sonata, for instance, that has been success successfully cut into small pieces. Uh, every piece uh, has a spectral description. A spectrum is a distribution of frequency, so it's close to a probability distribution and is located on this uh, uh, differ differential manifold. So all the points I gathered into balls which has a special shape because we are not in a Euclidean uh, uh, geometry and every ball becomes a symbol. Then every symbol becomes a state in a certain graph or a certain automa automaton representation. And then, uh, bingo, you have model uh, sequence in time going from the raw signal to, the, to a high level symbolic representation gives you this kind of context continuation uh, structure where you can navigate and generate either uh, the original signal or a completely new signal which, was, which, which, which will be uh, very likely, uh, very uh, 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 close to the original stylistically. Okay, so this is the formal structure, which is called a suffix oracle. I won't, uh, I won't detail things. The, the only thing I will tell you is that it's a graph structure that gives you uh, the structures uh, that, uh, that helps you discover in real time, incrementally, all the possible patterns on a, on a sequence. And all these possible patterns are expressed through arrows that build up a certain tree structure that give the whole partial of the order describing a family of uh, patterns. So, uh, uh, the, the, the automaton has a time structure, which is if you go from state, state to state, from left to right, you are reconstructing the original sequence. But if you take, if you jump following any arrow, you will do some context continuation recombination, just as, as I showed you, remember here, you have a context here, you have a context here, you jump, and it is coherent uh, musically, because you jump from, this, uh, so from a certain context to the same context. This is exactly the same representation, except it is uh, drawn with nice colors and nice uh, shapes. Okay, so time for a first example. So, the difference now with the Bach example is that there is an interaction between the musician and the system. The system learns in real time, so the musician plays and the, the system hooks up instantly and learns in real time and plays by just navigating this graph uh, structure. So uh, you will hear the, first the musician playing and then on the other channel, uh, the, the system beginning to play. So at the beginning, the system is dumb or exactly more, more uh, precisely, uh, it's like a baby, a little baby that is just bubbling, trying to repeat things. But very quickly, we'll, you will see that it learns and then it becomes, it, it becomes very quickly rich, dense and interesting interesting enough for the musician to have the desire to interact and you will feel that, you will see how the musician plays with the system. Sorry, up again. Oh. Oh, I have only one channel. Which is a pity because we have only the musician and we are lacking the, the computer playing. So let's see something. Sorry for that. Uh, I think I have only one channel. But let me see. Uh, it's fine. Yes, yes. Let's try again. So, so, uh, sorry. Can you hear the second one? 
Yeah, but it's just uh, an echo of the second one, but the, the real thing is on, the, on the, uh, another channel. Uh, can you, do you get something on this channel? Not, mm, not much. So can you check that? I think we have nothing on this channel. Yeah, you get, you're getting mono? Oh, wow. That's a problem. That's really a problem. Well, let's see. Let's try this. Ah, okay, let's try. Oh, here. Oh, careful, it's going to be uh, quite uh, powerful. So now, uh, uh, left. Right. Okay, nothing on the right. Stereo. Try here. Okay, it worked from the computer. It worked on the computer, but then when it when it goes into the, the, the so do you have a solution? On va essayer comme ça. Ouais. Bon, c'est pas grave, je vais continuer. Et si jamais la technique... Oh, sorry, uh, I'm speaking French. <laughs> no problem, I'll continue. And, and, and uh, if they find a technical solution, I will, I will get back to the uh, example. No problem. All right, maybe we can... Uh, maybe, maybe we can look at this uh, this example because I think even in mono it should uh, it should work. Okay, so uh, in the previous example that you didn't hear, there is an interaction between uh, the musician and the computer system. But the computer the computer listens to the, the musician in order to learn from from the musician, but, and then the computer plays. But the computer does not listen at the time it plays; uh, it just generates things. So it's really up to the musician to find out interesting strategies in order to interact and play things with the computer. So it's not completely satisfactory. What we would like is uh, have the computer being able to uh, closely listen to the musician uh, for learning things as well as for conditioning what it's going to, it's going to play. Uh, this is, for instance, the case if you want to, to have the computer be, uh, be, be able to uh, uh, create an accompaniment for the musician. What we would like, actually, is this, uh, this kind of situation.
So what's happening here? It's really interesting. It's a completely improv uh, improvised setup. The computer doesn't know in, in advance what the musician is going to play. The musician doesn't know exactly what the, com uh, the computer has uh, in memory. And it, it feels like an uh, accompaniment, like if the computer was accompanying, uh, uh, accompanying the, the, the musician, but it's not really accompaniment because the computer is improvising. It's improvising freely using its own musical memory, all the things that it has learned, but it's closely listening to the musician. So the computer is taken into kind of dialecti dialectics between its sound uh, freedom, that is form, that is the, the form of its memory, finding trajectory in the, mem the memory that has a certain uh, geometrical or topological uh, structure. And causality, that is, events are coming from the musician and the, the, the computers know it better try to match what the musician is doing and try to find pathos in all the possibilities, trying to find pathos that are uh, as consistent, harmonic for instance, harmonically, texturally, melodically, as possible with the musician. And you could not achieve such a result, which is, which is uh, kind of the state of the art in, uh, in um, um, man-machine co-improvisation, without having uh, something more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated than, than what, what I showed previ previously. So what you need is a smart memory activation scheme. And now we are moving from purely mathematical and formal and uh, uh, things inspired by formal languages and automata, uh, automata theory and signal processing and machine listening to go up to some, uh, some more cognitive uh, 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 modeling. So the idea here is that you have your sequential uh, memory, which is still modeled as a state machine, as you, can, as you can see here. Except that now we are going to uh, impose a probabilistic continuous uh, uh, um, uh, device uh, upon it that is going to, to, to create activation profiles that will tell the system where are the hot, uh, the hot spot in the memory. That is, the musician is playing, and this will activate profiles in the memory telling that some parts of the memory are more interesting than uh, others. So, for instance, here, suppose that the uh, environment, the musician, is playing the sequence A, B, C. So, you have the A entering the system and all the A location will be activated. And then you have B, so all the B uh, uh, location here uh, will be activated. But still, the A is still active and uh, the A is evolving in time. So now you have time here and the, 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 the activation of the state labeled A, we move in time to the next state, which is here, and then uh, later to the next step with this kind of expo uh, uh, expon exp exponential damping. So when B, B is, in, is entering, B is activated, but, uh, but the next occurrence of A is moving in time and, 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 and waiting this state here, which is B. So uh, uh, this state uh, gets a, ver uh, a, ve a very high weight. And then when C is uh, uh, entering, again, you have the, the trace in time of a of A which is evolving, and then you have a trace in time of B which is evolving, and then you get a certain configuration pattern. So now, uh, the system is able to recognize fuzzy pattern because here you have the pattern ADC, which is different from ABC, but still it's activated. It's less activated from uh, than ABC, of course, because ABC is the, is, is the exact recognition of the external pattern, but it's, it's interesting because it is a closed pattern. So we have a more fuzzy uh, model. And uh, um, these uh, memory profiles can be activated for different uh, musical information channels. It can be uh, activated for, the, for the, the, the harmonical information channel, for melody, for rhythm, for texture, for timbres, and all this profile we sum up into a global uh, 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 weighted uh, uh, profile. So for instance, in this profile, you have here a hotspot telling the system instantly that depending on self-listening, that, that is what I know, what I've been trained for, and what's happening in the real world, world that is what the musician is actually play, playing, this is the best part in the memory. This is the hottest part in memory. And if I can find a pass and, and a series of jump to bring me here very, very quickly, then I know that I will be consistent with the external world, with the musician. And this is how it happens in the sequence. Uh, same way for the rhythm. Rhythm is just another channel of information. So if you are at a certain location of a memory and you, you are aware that there is a certain pulse uh, uh, in, in the music, then the things to do is just to create a profile that will have a high level 
level of activation for each multiple of the pulse. So uh, uh, events at, that are well aligned in phase with the pulse will be favored with regard to events that are not aligned in phase. And this profile we just sum up with the other profile with a certain weight. So you'll be able to give more weight to harmony or to rhythm or to pulsation, uh, 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 etc. So this is a, uh, the, uh, a summary of the of the, this new uh, system. You have the external world, that is the environment, and you have the internal world, which is the musical memory. But both are, are divided into channels of musical information. For instance, uh, harmony, melody, timbre, whatever. For each uh, channel inf of information, you have a memory model that has been trained uh, uh, by uh, making the system listen to a lot of, of, of music. So you have this formal structure, the graph uh, that, that you saw uh, um, previously. Uh, and um, Every time, uh, so the system moves freely inside uh, uh, his memory, but uh, uh, every time the, the musician in the external world play, for every channel of information, uh, memory profiles that are symbol symbolized here with this red uh, profile will be activated for each channel information, you know, of information and sum up in a certain global profile that tells the system where to go, where to go in the memory. Okay, I won't give uh, uh, more detail, and I will just show you two examples, and that will, and that will, be, that will be it. First example, uh, uh, the system has been trained uh, with the Klavierstück by uh, Schoenberg. So the system is able to improvise in the style of Schoenberg. And this will be a keyboard sound. And then you have a, a saxophone player who, is, who will improvise, uh, improvise freely. And the system who is improvising on the Schoenberg will, just exactly as, as in the previous video, will try to follow the musician and to be consistent with the musician. One thing you can notice is that it's a very different style from the other example. The previous example was jazz. This is 20th century music. So the system is completely agnostic. It doesn't know actually about uh, uh, the definition of, uh, um, uh, of style and musical historical periods. It, it learns everything it knows from scratch, from listening to the, mu to the music. So it's not style uh, dependent. Sorry. Okay, something happens uh, at a certain time here, uh, 36 here. At a certain time, the, the system, so the system plays Schoenberg, improvises and try to be coherent with the musician, but it also listens to the musician. At a certain time, we launch a new agent who is who has learned not from Schoenberg, but in real time from the performance from the musician. So we'll have a new agent playing with a saxophone sound in the style of the musician. So we'll have three musicians, the real saxophonist, the clone of the saxophonist, which is improvising, and the Schoenberg clone, uh, which is also improvising. And the three of them listen to both others and try, uh, and try to uh, um, uh, synchronize uh, and, uh, and create a, a coherent form. So let's let's see how it works. So the sax clone. So both clone listen one to each other and, and try to work together.
And I will finish with the last example, maybe more clearer, where we have only the saxophonist and two clones of the saxophonist, which are freely improvising. So here, we don't have any external reference. In, in, in both previous examples, we had trained. We had trained the system in advance, offline. You know, in the first case with a lot of jazz uh, voicings, in the second case with the Schoenberg um, uh, Klavierstück. Here there is absol uh, absolutely no uh, offline training, so it's all on the fly coming from the material and from the energy of the musician. And th that will be the last example. <laughs> further. So what happened just there is that the musician had, had played a few key notes that recall the initial team, da da di da di da da la li la la, and all, then all the agents, because this is a very hot spot in the memory, because it's a theme that has been played several times, they will all tend to converge instantly to this location in memory. So the, music, the musician gets the feeling that he's ac actually driving the process, and, uh, and that he can call the, the, the artificial a agent and, 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 and drive them into some location of uh, the musical structure. And what happened in effect is that, is that you have this kind of, of unison at the end, and everybody playing the same thing, which is a very, very nice thing uh, when you have this kind of uh, behavior in an artificial system because it's free so it, it injects new ID it's it's challenging for the musician but still the musician uh, can feel in, uh, uh, in control and can, f can feel that he has the control and uh, that uh, the, the, uh, he or she can drive the process in order to perform uh, uh, to converge uh, to a certain musical ID in order to respect maybe some form that uh, he or she has in mind so I will uh, I will stop with this uh, example uh, thank you for your attention. And I will leave the chair now to Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who is going to tell you about the shape in musical instruments. <laughs> 